Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. As mentioned earlier in this series, the wrath of God is not so much anger as it is his passion, his desire, and his purpose to bring all of creation to himself. As we see, the bowls of the wrath of God are called plagues, which Strong's defines as a stroke or wound, rendered more correctly as stripes in Luke 12, 48. So the bowls of God's wrath are his necessary discipline to rid us of our pride. The word bowls is found 12 times in the King James New Testament, all of them in Revelation. 12 denotes divine government, agreeing with our need for discipline or governance. The bowls originate from the following. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Here we find that the bowls are the golden bowls of incense, or prayers of the saints. This brings us back to the seventh seal. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, with the prayers of the saints, ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Here's why I believe the trumpets and bowls run parallel. When the seventh seal is opened, John sees an angel with a golden censer, given much incense which he offers with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. The prayers and incense ascend to God. Then the angel takes the censer, fills it with fire from the altar and throws it to the earth, agreeing with Revelation 16.1. What follows are the noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. These are the same components seen in the sounding of the seventh trumpet and pouring out of the seventh bowl. Because this is the seventh seal, the golden censer or bowl in the angel's hand typifies the fullness of all the bowls, hence the reason Revelation 15.1 declares, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. The seventh prophecy, seal, trumpet, and bowl, are the manifestation of all that is declared in the preceding six seals, trumpets, and bowls. As God rests, his prophetic word unfolds in exactly the manner intended. Such is God's sovereignty. The seventh prophecy, seal, trumpet, and bowl are the manifestation of the day of the Lord, the great day of their wrath, the coming of the Son of Man. We have been passing through the sounding of trumpets and the pouring out of the bowls since shortly after the days of Christ and the apostles. Peter defined this as the last days culminating with the great and awesome day of the Lord. This great and awesome day began after the falling away. It is the great day of their wrath. This brings us back to the following. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head, and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle, and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. 
So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire. And he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the winepress, as high as a horse's bridle, for sixteen hundred stadia. One like a son of man correlates with the coming of the Son of Man. Then we see the Son of Man reap the harvest of the earth in keeping with the hour of judgment. Once reaped or gathered, another angel comes out of the temple in heaven, who also has a sharp sickle. Then. Most importantly, another angel comes out from the altar, who has authority over the fire. This is the same angel seen in the seventh seal. The angel with the sickle is not harvesting, for that is done by the Son of Man. Rather, he is separating the good fruit from the bad, taking the bad fruit or clusters from the vine of the earth, and throwing them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. This correlates with Revelation, chapter 16. As noted, the winepress is trampled outside the city, agreeing with Revelation 11.2. That which tramples the winepress are the nations, agreeing with our understanding of Armageddon. For this reason Jesus stated, In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The blood that flows from the winepress denotes the slow but effectual eradication of the life of the flesh or self. Finally, we come to the fire from the altar, agreeing with the angel who has authority over the fire. Paul explains the reason for this fire in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15. In perfect agreement, Peter said this, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. Here we are, my friend. God's wrath is His passion, and His fire is the necessary discipline to purify us. His wrath is not the destruction of the physical world, but the destruction of the world that abides in our hearts and minds, preventing us from setting our affections on things above. Let us be grateful for the wrath of God, 